Okay, well, uh, my presentation is going to deal with the uh, Gospel of John this morning, and as you can tell from the title, approaches to the fourth gospel. I'm going to be referring to it as the fourth gospel throughout this lecture, so if you hear FG or fourth gospel, obviously I'm talking about the Gospel of John. And for those of you who know me, and several of you here do, know that I am obsessed with the, <laughs> with the Gospel of John for many years. And it now is consuming me in my doctoral work. I'm working on a dissertation right now, tracing a theme of Christian suffering throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, but what I want to talk about today is the sort of this enormous amount of Johannine literature that there is, or, or approaches that have been taken to the Gospel of John. So there, there's this enormous amount of literature on the fourth Gospel. And trying to categorize how everybody has interpreted this thing is kind of hard to do. Um, but I'm going to give a very modest, humble attempt, and I think it's very helpful for those of you here, who, uh, here in the group, especially you DMIN students, who are pastors or are preaching or teaching John within your church settings or you're planning to do further work on it. So I hope this will be helpful for you. Um, I talked about I love John. I know so many people have throughout history, and, and who doesn't love the Gospel of John, right? Um, back in the fourth century, Augustine said very famously, John's gospel is deep enough for an elephant to swim, but shallow enough for a child not to drown. I love that statement because it really shows the simplicity and the profundity of John sort of together in this one gospel that has caused so much interest. Um, but unfortunately, because of the obsession uh, with the fourth gospel, it has been mishandled in every which way possible throughout history. I mean, we can go all the way back to the late second century, Clement of Alexandria, who first uh, pigeonholed for the fourth gospel as a spiritual gospel. Um, and then to the third century, his pupil, Origen, uh, would write one of the very first commentaries on John. And of course, would go on to become the father of allegory. So while everybody loves John's gospel, it is, though, historically one of the most challenging Gospels to interpret and teach. And I think sometimes because, because it's so simple, as Augustine said on the second part of his clause, that it's shallow enough for a child not to drown, that we sort of assume a lot about the, the, the fourth Gospel without really getting into the complexities of it and how challenging it can be. For example, the 20th century saw an explosion of scholarly interest. Uh, on the fourth gospel, the majority of which was driven by critical scholarship. Now just consider this, in a 45 year period, from 1920 to 1965 alone, there were over 3,000 academic and critical works published on the fourth gospel. Now all of this is helpful to know, uh, since the Gospel of John is often the go-to New Testament document uh, to exposit in church settings. I remember when I uh, helped plant a church, it was the first gospel we went through. It took two years to go through the Gospel of John, a uh, church that my wife are currently in now. I, when we first started there, we were going through the Gospel of John, I believe. It's oftentimes the gospel you give to non-believers. Um, you know, it, it extols the, de the deity of Christ, and it can be so simple as well. So it's sort of the go-to gospel that we start with. But because of that, I think that's why this is so important to know the different approaches that have been taken. Um, I'd say it, it's helpful. I'd say it's even vital for you uh, who, do, who are D-Men uh, students, who are pastors or who are teachers, uh, to know the different approaches that have been taken. Know where you fit within those approaches, and you might be inadvertently crossing over to the other approach without even really knowing it. And so you can be able to confidently in, interpret and exposit this amazing book, uh, I would say, from a truly evangelical or even fundamental standpoint. So, diachronic and synchronic, the past 150 years, I mentioned earlier the enormous amount of literature that's been written on John, and it is a beast trying to classify it. But I think throughout the last 150 years, if we take a modern history, uh, the last 150 years on the fourth gospel can be virtually classified into two broad categories, diachronic approaches and synchronic readings. Now, diachronic approaches, or better, historical reconstructions, uh, have mainly directed its efforts on historical critical matters, most notably attempting to reconstruct the origin, the authorship, and the development of the fourth gospel as they relate to a community of readers. By approaching the text looking for aporias, aporias are believed to be inconsistencies in the fourth gospel. Uh, an example would be 
in John 3, the text says that Jesus came into Judea, but the text before it said he already was in Judea, or the famous or infamous pericope adultery, the, the woman caught in adultery, it, it disrupts the flow of the text. Uh, another example would be the epilogue. It, the, the, the gospel seems to end in 2031 with the purpose statement. These things were written so that you believe in Christ, and yet there's a whole other chapter after it. So liberal scholars or critical scholars see those things called, and they, they label them aporias, meaning inconsistencies. And those are sort of like, like cut and paste pieces of evidence of people that have redacted the gospel. They're going into the text, these diachronic advocates. They're going into the text relying on standard critical methods that are assumed to provide windows through which to view the gospel's historical development. So basically, diachronic advocates aren't just reading the Gospel of John to read what it says about Jesus. They're looking for these inconsistencies as windows to see what it says about its development, how the fourth gospel became what we know it as today. Synchronic approaches or readings have chosen to focus on the text of the fourth gospel as it stands, or oftentimes it's called its final form in the canon. Uh, it's expressed in, a lot of times expressed in narrative critical terms, such as viewing the fourth gospel mainly as dramatized literature or a story. Now, inquiries of history within synchronic approaches are either suspended for a focus on John's literary value, or the gospel's historical veracity is assumed on a unique, but even keel with the synoptics. Now, from the outset, the clear demarcation dividing the two approaches concerns the problem of history. Okay? Diachronic approaches have generally assumed a radical independence between John and the synoptic tradition, as Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three Gospels believed to be more historically trustworthy in what they report than what John reports. Synchronic approaches, by contrast, generally allow a more interdependence between uh, viewing all four canonical Gospels purposefully overlapping with one another, with John deepening the theological significance of historical events contained in the Synoptics. Now, if scholars... So we're talking people, if scholars can represent the progress of both categories, one might start with C.H. Dodd as the fountainhead initiating diachronic Johannine studies, at least in the English-speaking world. Though, of course, if you know anything about Dodd, you can't make too sharp of a distinction because he also cast a very wide net influencing synchronic or later narrative criticism as well. But really, we're going to pigeonhole him if we have to on the diachronic side. Now, if you don't think about Don, Dodd, C.H. Dodd, he's mostly known for his realized eschatology. That's the idea that eschatological, all eschatological implications of the, of the fourth gospel, anything concerning social and political elements, prophecies, whatever it may be, are entirely fulfilled in Christ, and there's nothing future to be anticipated. That's what he's mostly known for. But he also advanced a form critical method, which was really influenced by a guy named P. Gardner Smith that reconstructed a blended, a blended oral tradition behind the text in order to get to the historical Jesus. So he would say, when you're reading the Gospel of John, you can't really get to this historical Jesus just by the text. You got to get behind it to try to reconstruct and see who, what the historical Jesus was all about. So Dodd, he really opened the floodgates to this historical reconstructions in Britain, uh, which would later really influence America. But he borrowed it, this form criticism, heavily from Germany in large measure by its most dominating force in the 20th century, and you probably heard his name, Rudolf Bultmann. Bultmann himself was a conflicted advocate of the history of religion school. And he also wrote the commentary on John that may be considered the colossus of fourth gospel commentaries in the 20th century. Well, B Bultmann approached the fourth gospel from a radical form critical perspective, thought it was in vain to attempt to ever to discover the true historical Jesus just by reading the Gospel of John. Now, Dodd and Boltmann were later followed by guys like J. Lewis Martin, Raymond Brown, and others who, who kind of tempered and refined their ideas into different hypotheses regarding the fourth gospel's authorship and, devel and development. Now, remember, on the diachronic side, it's all about reconstructing the development of the fourth gospel. It's not just taking it as is. It is when we read the fourth gospel, we really have to see, we have to look for inconsistencies, these aporias, and try to reconstruct what's really happening behind the text. So J. Lewis Martin and Raymond Brown continued that line. 
um, kind of redacted and refined these hypotheses, community hypotheses and whatnot. The fruits born from their scholarly labor, uh, labors include familiar critical concepts. If you know anything about John, you're going to come up with these concepts like Johannine community hypothesis or redactional hypothesis, the Gnostic redeemer myth, big from Boltmont, uh, a dual horizon reading, uh, and the Johannine school. Martin and Brown, for example, they advocated for a two-level reading of the fourth gospel, which is a hermeneutical approach dividing implied authors and audience from actual authors and audience. And by this, they meant that the interpreter of John should discern between the surface level of the text, which reports on Jesus and his ministry and calls for a global response to him in John 20, 31, uh, on one side, and on the other, the pressing situation and the needs of the community to which the, the authors were cryptically addressing. So there, there, there's two levels of reading when you read the fourth gospel, uh, according to Martin and Brown. You know, one is what does the text just say on the surface? And also what's behind the text that's addressing the community that probably helped develop this gospel, or at least is addressing this spe specific sectarian group. Often appealed to as an example why they do this. It, it, it's sort of a, a, a it, it's sort of the pinnacle of, of it, well, I shouldn't say it's the pinnacle, but it's, it's up for grabs if you're a critical diachronic advocate of what to use as an example to prove your case. And it's generally the blind man in John chapter 9. And the reason being is because he was expelled. If you remember the story, he, after he, he's healed by Christ, um, he, do, he, he goes through all these interrogations with the Pharisees. His parents throw him under the bus. Um, at the very end, he's expelled from the community. And three times in John 9, 22, 12, 42, and 16, 2, Jesus is even talking about that you're going to be expelled, you know, expelled from the from the community from the uh, synagogue, and these critical scholars will say, see, that's 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 history that that was written later because that was written into rabbinic later rabbinic literature. This blessing, not blessing, but this this liturgical thing they call a benediction on heretics, uh, which were people who believed in Jesus and they were not allowed in the synagogue, and because that is found in later rabbinic literature. literature when they read the blind man being expelled from the synagogue in chapter 9, they're saying that's proof that this was written after the fact. Um, you know, talking about the community that it's written to, this Johanna community, who has been expelled from the Jewish community. That's, what, that's generally the, the big sort of silver bullet they use. A related and most notable of critical theories, however, is the concept of a Johannine school, whose genesis may have had its beginning with Strauss, if not Schleiermacher, all the way back to the early 1800s. That theory held that the members of a cultic community or network of churches that had either direct or indirect interpersonal links to one another were the ones responsible for the development of the fourth gospel. Um, so basically all of these people, none of them were saying that the Apostle John wrote the fourth gospel, by the way. You know, they're going to say that it developed through a community and, and redactors, right? And that thought held sway in Johannine scholarship well into the 20th century, casting a shadow still hovering over the field today. Uh, the longevity of the Johannine school and uh, Johannine community uh, hypotheses may be due to them believing them to offer a via media, a middle position for the provenance of the fourth gospel. That is, between defenders of apostolic authorship on one side, which would be the more evangelical perspective, and critics on, who may, uh, who, on the other side who maintain that the gospel was written at a later date, and certainly not by the Apostle John. So they think that these, these hypotheses kind of offer a via media, a middle position. Though largely abandoned by today's scholars, the Johannine school and community theory still loom large over critical scholarship, so much so that overcorrections are now being made by those following in this liberal tradition. For example, Hugo Mendez, a very young and promising professor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. If you know anything about that school, he's also a colleague of Bart Ehrman. Uh, he, in attempt, to reconcile the similarities between all the canonical Yohani literature, that is the fourth gospel, one, first, second, and third John, as well as Revelation, he's noticing that there's similarities in them, and there should be, because they're all written by one author, as we would say. Uh, he still presupposes out of hand that apostolic authorship is impossible. But also, a Yohani community never factually existed it either. So for Mendes, Hugo Mendes, this, this scholar, Rather than accepting a single apostolic authorship for the fourth gospel and John's other writings, simil any similarities in words and style between them have historically been attributed to that we've historically attributed to the apostle John uh, are better accounted for by a chain of literary forgeries. He's going to say all similarities we find throughout the entire Johannine corpus in the New Testament 
The only reason why they seem similar is because there are certain, there are different people that wrote them, but they're purposely masquerading as a single author writing forgeries. So taking critical assumptions to an extreme, Mendez deems the fourth gospel in John's epistles as pseudepigraphal literature composed by multiple unknown authors masquerading as a single eyewitness of Jesus' life. He cannot just accept the fact that these similarities might suggest pretty heavily that John wrote all of them. I mean, that already, he's already been presupposed. That can't be the case because that's the traditional conservative persuasion. So it must be a bunch of different people wrote it, but masquerading as a single eyewitness. And though his conclusions may seem novel, in the end, Mendez is merely representing the logical trajectory of diachronic approaches traced back to Dodd, Boltman, Martin, and others by offering his radical theory of the fourth gospel's compositional history, because that's what the diachronic approach does. Such historical reconstructions are proof that, while the turn of the 20th century may have witnessed a steady decline in diachronic approaches and Johannine studies, there remains a remnant, a very strong remnant of practitioners, despite any predictions to the contrary. And to that, I would, I would point to Robert Kaiser in the early 70s, who actually tried to prophesy that there wouldn't be these postmodern readings anymore by the time we got to the years of 2000. And of course, he's been proven wrong. So that's diachronic. What about synchronic readings? Okay. Well, while historical, critical, or diachronic studies dominated the landscape in the early, uh, excuse me, in the majority of the 20th century of Johannian scholarship, a watershed occurred with Alan Culpepper's landmark text, Anatomy of the Fourth Gospel, which was published in 1983. Shifting from his earlier diachronic work, best captured in his dissertation and first monograph on the Johannine School, um, Culpepper refocused his efforts toward exploring the literary design of the Gospel of John as it stands in the New Testament canon. What concerned Culpepper was the text as text, in terms of its major constituents, such as plot, character, and the like, and with the reader of the text both within and outside the text. Any historical development that may lie behind the fourth gospel, which occupied previous scholarship, was no longer the focus. The story of the fourth gospel was. All right? And that's where you kind of get this bit buzzword of story. If you ever wonder where in New Testament studies, especially John, how everything's considered a story, well, we can trace that like in a major way uh, to Culpepper. <clears throat> so the story was now the purpose of, of how, why you study the gospel and what it represents and how it was meant to affect the reader. And Culpepper is sort of a precursor to later reader response criticism because um, he understood the text meaning to be produced in the experience of reading the gospel and lies on, uh, reading, reading the gospel and lies on this side of the text between the reader and the text. So Culpepper is going to say meaning is produced between not, not just what the author intended, whoever that author may be, or what the text says, uh, but how it affects the reader, and that's where meaning is produced. So from Culpepper and, other, uh, and others developed a new line of, uh, of, uh, of study of the fourth gospel that's called narrative criticism, which was meant to be distinct from outdated forms of literary criticism, looking to determine sources by dissecting different language forms without any respect to differing contexts. At least Culpepper's going to say, no, we got to respect the context, but what does the literature, the very literary form, say within that context? And that's as far as he's going to go. So I, I think it's no overstatement to claim Culpepper as the father of modern synchronic approaches to John. And with Culpepper's groundbreaking work, which is now enshrined as narrative criticism, Johannine scholarship got a new wave of researchers who viewed any attempt at reconstructing a supposed history of the fourth gospel behind the text as nothing more than erudite subjectivity, you know, just wasted efforts on a hypothesis that you can't prove. Uh, in contrast, this new crop, uh, crop of Johannine scholars saw more potential in accepting the historicity of the canonical text as is, or at least refraining from, refraining from reconstructing it, choosing instead to explore literary features and themes contained in the gospel itself. So terms familiar to storyboards and novels, such as plot or story and style, became the new norm in the world of John's scholarship. Culpepper cast the, cast the net wide for further synchronic studies, perhaps most ably advanced today by Stanley Porter, who added voice to the bag of Johannine terms. Porter would go further than Culpepper in his suspension of historical inquiry into the fourth gospel, though, because uh, Porter will, will give full credit 
to the historical plausibility of John's gospel, adding considerable weight to a more conservative approach to Johannine studies. And uh, moreover, synchronic approaches have been become refreshed in recent times by those who prefer, prefer a theological reading of the text as their starting point. And we'll get into that in just a little bit here. So since Culpepper's anatomy of the fourth gospel, other more conservative, even confessional Johannine scholars have risen from the ranks of synchronic advocacy in relation to the fourth gospel. That include D.A. Carson, Andreas Kostenberger, Richard Bauckham, uh, Robert Yarbrough, and, and others. These scholars have progressed past the early to mid-century obsession of reconstructing the history and development of the fourth gospel, choosing instead to accept John as a factual document supported by reliable eyewitness testimony. For these scholars, a correct biblical theological method depends on the historical trustworthiness of the gospel accounts to include as author or sources as history is what grounds the Christian religion. And so these guys are going to say, if you know anything about Carson and, and, and Kostenberger and even and Bauckham, they're going to say, no, the actual, the, the, the source of the gospel, the author behind the gospel is, at, is critical to know anything about, about the themes. Because whatever, intent, whatever he intended to say, that's where meaning is going to be found, as opposed to trying to reconstruct all these multiple authors, and there's really no application of the gospel for today. So they're going to tie meaning all the way back to that apostolic authorship. <clears throat> uh, and for them, the meaning of a given text or pericope was not to be found in the reader's experience of that text, as in Culpepper and other narrative critics, but tied directly to the intention of the text author. So it was authorial intent that provided the meaning of a given text. Rather than falsely dichotomizing the fourth gospel into either history or theology, a more conservative approach was now maintained that viewed history and literature working in tandem as vehicles of divine revelation, and then yielding rich theological insights as the pinnacle of New Testament studies. But conservative hermeneutical paradigms were applied to all areas of biblical studies, including the fourth gospel, that sought to respect the canonical text's historical background, literary dimensions, and theological message. Coining the ge geometric term hermeneutical triad, Kostenberger, along with Richard Patterson, offers the exemplar hermeneutical, hermeneutical approach to the canon of scripture that undergirds any responsible biblical theology. And I quote, this is from Kostenberger explaining uh, the hermeneutical triad as uh, and the history of Christian religion. Quote, the historical dimension of the biblical text can never be relegated to the sidelines since Christianity is by its very nature a historical religion whose truthfulness depends on the historical nature of events such as the incarnation or, body, or Jesus' body resurrection from the dead. The literary study of scripture, while a legitimate part of biblical interpretation, must be grounded in historical study and scripture, and scripture be seen not merely as a human witness or as an autonomous entity, but as inspired, historically grounded divine revelation. Thus, we have argued that history language, and theology form a hermeneutical triad with theology as the apex. Now, though conservative approaches of the fourth gospel have enjoyed a resurgence among Johannine scholars the past several decades, it should by, it should by no means be considered a recent innovation. Uh, of special note, both Kostenberger and Robert Yarbrough have probably done more than any other to introduce modern English readers uh, to the premier early 20th century conservative German scholar Adolf Schlatter, who as a colleague to Adolf Van Harnack and a peer to the younger Rudolf Bultmann, swam virtually alone in a sea of liberal reconstructionists. When those such as Bultmann convinced the scholarly world that the fourth gospel was birthed out of a Hellenistic Gnosticism and heavily redacted by a later sectarian group, Schlatter maintained the Jewishness of the fourth gospel, its dependence on the Old Testament, its apostolic integrity, and its reliability as an authentic Jewish Christian document. And it's really, it's, it's remarkable when you consider that Schlatter came to these conclusions before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls was, um, as you know, a, monumentous, uh, a monumental uh, discovery, archaeological discovery in the 20th century, and it affected all of biblical scholarship, specifically fourth gospel scholarship. Because until then, People just hang, hang on to, like, Boltmont's theory that the fourth gospel is really, whoever the author was, which was multiple authors, but let's just consider him just one, was a convert, a Gnostic convert, uh, 
who took this redeemer myth from Gnostic, you know, Gnosticism and just applied it or refined it for his gospel. And so it was birthed out of this, this, this Hellenistic Western Gnosticism. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the manuscript showed so many affinities between what was found in, the, those, in those Qumran documents and what we see in the New Testament, specifically John's gospel. Then people just, you know, kind of dropped both on and said, no, the fourth gospel is clearly Jewish because you can see these dualisms like light and darkness and wickedness and righteousness that were discovered among Qumran. So we don't have to be relied on this Gnostic, Gnostic redeemer myth, you know, hypothesis. But Schlatter, the guy I'm talking about now, the, who, who was a little bit older than Boltmann, he came to the conclusion that the fourth gospel was entirely Jewish and dependent on the Old Testament before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So it makes him very remarkable. In a critical assessment of a conservative Schlatter against the backdrop of the liberal Boltmann, another uh, modern conservative uh, German scholar right now, Peter, uh, Peter Stuhlmacher, he pointed out rightly so that Schlatter correctly understood Jesus and the apostles as naturally born Jews and refused to separate the Palestinian and Hellenistic communities in the style of Boltmann and his students interpreting the message of the New Testament witness in the light of Jewish sources known at the time. Contrary to Boltmann, there was reason outside of presupposing its existence to postulate a Johannine Christology dependent on a Gnostic Redeemer myth taught from a community school studying in ancient mystery societies, which is what Boltmann's theory was on the fourth gospel. More recently, however, and I mentioned this briefly earlier, conservative approaches have advocated theology as the hermeneutical paradigm through which to interpret the fourth gospel, and they've now added their voice to the conversation. Uh, one such advocate is Edward Clink, uh, who wrote the Big Zondervan commentary on John. He believes that, quote, the nature of scripture requires the foundation of doctrine in order to rightly interpret this fourth gospel as a unique text. To make historical analyses as the foundation limits from the start what the interpreter sees and does with the text. Now, Clink is by no means alone as he follows, if you're familiar with what his argument is, he's following in the wake of the TIS movement, Theological Interpretation of Scripture. Which, who, which is pioneered by guys like Daniel Traer, Stephen Fowle, and Kevin Van Hooser. And they're going to say, you start with theology. You don't end with it. You start with it. So there are more recent expressions of synchronic readings, but we'll stop here and consider its uh, relevance for us today. I'm at about 27 minutes here. So talking about diachronic versus synchronic or synchronic versus diachronic. The obvious question, why does this matter? Right? This isn't just a boring history lesson. Well, as I started off this morning, for those of you who preach John, it is helpful to know the different approaches that have come before you and know which ones may be influencing you, whether you realize it or not. Okay? Despite any implicit egotistical notions that we may carry when we think we've discovered something new, the truth is no one, no one interpreter is an island to themselves. And we all play a small part in the colossal history of hermeneutics and biblical theology. So you as a reader, as a preacher of John's gospel, you're just simply carrying on a conversation that goes back to the first known commentary ever written on John, which is by a guy named Heracleon in the second century, a Gnostic disciple of Valentinus, by the way. But to a large extent, I actually agree with Alan Culpepper who said in his landmark study, Anatomy of the Fourth Gospel, that when it comes to John, there, can, there, there can't be a methodological exclusiveness in our hermeneutics. Meaning, okay, I know my method is the only right one. I don't care what's happened beforehand. My conclusions are correct. My hermeneutical method is, 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 is correct. And be so rigidly thinking in that way, especially, <clears throat> excuse me, especially when it comes to the Fourth Gospel. And because of that, I think we can and we should responsibly borrow from different streams of thought from what we've been given or handed down to us from these two big categories, right? It's no mystery what John's grand theological purpose is because he directly states in John 20, 31, that is that the entirety of the fourth gospel is meant to drive the reader to faith in Christ for eternal life. He says that very clearly in John 20, 31. A corollary is that however you interpret and preach any one pericope of the fourth gospel must support 
that purpose statement. And as such, I think there can be, I think there can be a thoroughly evangelical approach to the fourth gospel that is one that respects John's historical context, its literary dimensions, and theological message of the evangel. Right? That is the, the message, the believing in Christ for eternal life. So, assuming the two categories of diachronic and synchronic studies to actually represent the whole of Johannine scholarship, let's just assume that for the sake of this lecture, a thoroughly evangelical approach to the fourth gospel is one that is most influenced by synchronic readings of John, yet without the reduction of the fourth gospel as mere literature. Okay, that's the caveat there I have there on the, on the screen. A synchronic approach, yet without the reduction of the fourth gospel as mere literature, which is generally the approach taken now in community colleges and other schools that use the Bible among their comparative religion sources, uh, courses as just one among other sacred texts. All three points in Kostenberger's hermeneutical triad must be taken in full force and with equal weight given to each corner of history, literature, and theology. This means that traditional grammatical historical exegesis will be applied to the biblical text resulting in theological conclusions. So that order is very specific. History, you know, the historical context, the, what's happening, you know, with the provenance of the, of the authorship and all that stuff, you deal with that. Moving into literature, which is the genre, uh, syntax, word studies, you're getting into the Greek or the Hebrew. And then finally, what is the theological conclusion or theological implications we can get from that specific text? Now that I said that, and those, or those orders of the points, these orders of the points notwithstanding, it does seem necessary to, that in some sense, Theology must be the initial guiding light in what directs any evangelical reading of the text, namely a doctrine of scripture. Okay. In fact, by coming to the fourth gospel with an evangelical doctrine of scripture in mind, I think that's going to ensure we're applying special hermeneutics. These are terms used in hermeneutical theory, special hermeneutics that recognizes this document, like the fourth gospel, is part of the living word of God, as opposed to general hermeneutics. That views the Bible. That views the Bible as just another piece of literature among the world's sacred text. So I'm saying, although these points should be, should be kept in mind, history, literature, then the theological conclusion. We, I, I think, it's a little disingenuous if we're going to say, as evangelicals or as fundamentalists, to say that we're not presupposing some theology at the outset. We are, and I'm saying it's actually critical that we have to assume a doctrine of Scripture, a a, a Protestant evangelical doctrine of Scripture then obviously this alludes to presuppositions that must be disclosed up front in order to maintain the integrity, uh, the integrity, a study that you're doing or a sermon you're preaching uh, on the text. Indeed, presuppositions from any interpreter of scripture are bound in their theological work and no one is exempt. However, such presuppositions should be checked and refined, even abandoned if necessary, in light of exegesis of scripture. So as such, and contrary to the diachronic method of historical reconstruction, an accurate evangelical, when I'm saying evangelical, I'm really meaning fundamental, being, going back to the fundamentals of, 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 of Christianity, the fundamentals of, of doctrine. Uh, so an accurate evangelical approach assumes traditional persuasions like the doctrine of inerrancy. The fourth gospel's author is not under, none other than John, the son of Zebedee. The gospel contains numerous theological messages, and any reader of the gospel is called to respond in obedience and faith. And that is why you can have so many non-believing critical scholars, some of the best minds within Johannine scholarship, that aren't even believers. Because they're not looking at the text as purposely calling us to obedience and faith. They're keeping it stuck, and let's just deal with the historical reconstructions of it. So while every passage explored will keep their historical and literary context at the fore, it will do so assuming their full inspiration and ultimate origin from God. Maintaining the full authorial intent of the biblical author and authority of scripture will yield such truths that illumine the character of God and man's relation to him, all of which originated in factual history. So in agreement with Kossenberger and Schlatter before him, we're going to say God's way of revealing 
to mankind is 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 twofold: history and theology. Right? These are the, the the vehicles for that in working in tandem to give us revelation. So, again, maintaining the full authorial intent of the biblical author and the authority of Scripture will yield such truths that illu- that illumine the character of God and man's relation to Him, all of which originated in factual history. So, and we're going to close on this. Consequently. I believe a thoroughly evangelical approach to the fourth gospel is one that takes several features of John for granted, or assumes them at the outset, and serves as a modified synchronic reading of the text. Again, synchronic with caveats. With that in mind, I phrase it this way, and I offer this to you guys, that this is how we should approach the fourth gospel. The fourth gospel, as it stands in the canon, is the inspired text of God, revealed through John the Apostle, an authoritative member of the original 12 disciples in the first century, who communicates multiple strands of theology, to which its reader is responsible to respond and either come to or grow in their faith in Jesus Christ for eternal life. Okay? In conclusion, this descriptive position on the Gospel of John takes into account, takes into account the synchronic approach of accepting the fourth gospel as it stands in the canon, or if you want to use the word its final form, uh, there, there are some issues to that as well, but that's an accepted way to look at it. The, we're not dealing with how it developed, we're just dealing with the form that we have in the canon without respect to how it may have developed over time, and that's contrary to the diachronic approach. But it goes further than that. And that it begins with or assumes a doctrine of Scripture. Now, that's the theology that I'm assuming at the outset to start with. So we are, it assumes a doctrine of Scripture that does respect its canonical placement and inspiration from God and prescriptive purpose of placing faith in Christ. So it's not merely a story for story's sake. It's actually calling us to obedience and faith in Christ. It also assumes the traditional historical positions handed down to us from church fathers that the document was actually written by John the Apostle. I didn't get into the evidence, but the evidence was overwhelming uh, from, the, from the earliest church fathers on that the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, is the one who wrote this gospel and is none other than the beloved disciple who's mentioned three times in the fourth gospel. Not a separate elder or a community that wrote it, but an actual real historical person, John the Apostle, who exists in a real time and space and writes his gospel as an authoritative disciple sent by Christ. 